Welcome to the Thin Places Travel Podcast, where we discuss places where the veil between this world and the eternal world is thin. I'm your host, Mindy Burgoyne. I really think there's something about the land. I don't know what it is, but it, especially for me, I swear I feel it in my bones that I'm, I'm back home. So I hope that people hear that in my music when I write it. Coming up, we'll hear from Joni Madden, founder of the all-woman Irish music band Cherish the Ladies. And we'll also hear from folks at the Irish Workhouse Center in Portumna in County Galway. In our last episode, we talked about a connection to the landscape, fueling a person's creativity and passion for their artistic outlets. And we discussed the concept that a place or where you are can have an effect on your own artistic productivity. And that Ireland seems to have an energy that just stirs creativity. It seems that Ireland is full of artists. You know, there are performing artists and literary artists, visual artists, and certainly there are musicians. And perhaps there's something in the land that stirs the creative soul. We're very happy that this week, St. Patrick's Day week, we're able to interview a very successful Irish-American musician. We're lucky to have with us Joni Madden. She's one of the founders of the all-woman Irish music band Cherish the Ladies. The group has been actively performing for 33 years, and Joni is a founder. Cherish the Ladies has been nominated for a Grammy and has recorded and released 17 albums. Their newest album, Heart of the Home, has just been released this month, and it features several tunes written by Joni. Joni is the child of Irish immigrants. She was raised in the Bronx, New York. Her father was from Portumna in the eastern part of County Galway, and her mother was from Milltown, Malbay, on the west coast of County Clare. Joni's an all-Ireland flute and whistle champion. She has sold over a half million solo albums and performed on over 200 recordings, including three Grammy-winning albums. And in 2016, Irish America Magazine named Joni as one of the top 50 most powerful Irish women in the world. So I'm here with Joni Madden of Cherish the Ladies. We're in Easton, Maryland at the Avalon Theater, one of my favorite places. Um, welcome, Joni. Well, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be on your program. And thank you for giving me the time. Um, I know our guests are going to love hearing from you. Tell me, I, I read about you on the website, and it's just such an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> So you're obviously not a uh, native Irelander because your accent does give you away. But why yes. don't you just tell us how you got into music and your connection with Ireland and all of that? Well, um, my parents both emigrated from Ireland. Uh, my mother from County Clare and my father, um, he was an All-Ireland champion on the accordion. And um, he had a very popular band in New York and um, kept the music going. And he was a carpenter by day and played music at night. And uh, I guess he was looking for one of his children to show him the sign that they have music because in Irish music, I mean, and and not just Irish, Irish household, but in Ireland, especially the music definitely comes down the family tree. And usually when you find a good musician, usually the grandparents or somebody you'll find, if you look back far enough, there's always a great musician in the, in the, in their past. So I definitely believe it's in the, it's in the bloodstream. But for me, I started playing music when I was about 12 and uh, picked up the whistle and I, I just fell in love with it. And I used to spend my summers going back to Ireland every year and competing in the All-Ireland Championships and trying to win the medal over there and finally accomplished that goal. But I started, uh, when I got back in 1983, I'd had a very successful year in Ireland. I won three gold medals at the All-Ireland Championship and also a, a, a silver with the Kelly Band. And there was nine women in that. And also my one of my best friends on the planet is a woman named Eileen Ivers, a great fiddle oh, player yeah. who grew up in the same neighborhood in the Bronx in Woodlawn section of the Bronx. And so it was not strange, even though I grew up in the Bronx, that I was playing Irish social music because there was so many of the other kids in my class that were doing it because we were in a very Irish neighborhood. And uh, she had won the All-Ireland on the fiddle, which was uh, an astounding um, result to have as well over there. And it was that when we came back, was that when Mick Maloney called me up to ask me to help him organize a series of concerts because he was amazed that so many of the Americans that won, 95% of them were women that were coming back, winning, bringing the gold medals. So he thought this was a phenomenon that should be celebrated. And he asked me to help him put a concert series together. And I suggested the title, Cherish the Ladies, off the top of my head. 
because it's the name of a traditional Irish jig we all learned to play. And we're still at it 33 years later. 33. So you founded, really, Cherish the Ladies. Yeah, I'm here since the day one. And Mary Coogan, and uh, Mary guitar Coogan. player. Yeah. Right, right. She's been, she's been involved in it since day one as well. And you've had people in and out. I know all kinds of people. Yeah, have been um, you. I, you know, we're going 33 years. And in the beginning, it was babies were the problem, you know, because the, the, the young girls had children and, and they just couldn't deal with the separation. So they had to leave, you know, we had Siobhan Egan. She was in the band for 13 years. And then she had a baby. And Maureen Doherty was an accordion player. And again, the children, they just couldn't deal with the separation. But we've had, uh, we've had some fantastic musicians come through and, and uh, go on to embark on fantastic solo careers. But uh, I've had plenty of opportunities that came down the pike, but I, I stayed committed to the band as a, uh, I kind of was the driving force behind mm-hmm. it since day one. So it's kind of my baby, and I, I stayed with it. And uh, here we are. We're still at it. We're still on the road, and we're just releasing our 17th album, an album called Heart, on the, Heart of the Home. Heart there of the Home, know. right. Yeah, I yes. just got that. That's uh, I, I picked it up from Mary earlier. So it's interesting. 33 years. Today's March 3rd, 3-3. Three, three. This is the day to play Uh-oh. Flam the Threes, right? There you go. Too bad it's almost over and I can't go get a lottery ticket, but no. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about Ireland and your connection to Ireland. And I'm sure you go on tour there because I've seen you myself there. We've On our tours, We whenever we're in Sligo, we always go to the Hawkswell, no matter who's playing. And one night you guys were playing and we happened to, you know, I bought tickets for everybody in the tour and we... Went to see Cherish the Ladies, and I think last time we saw Kevin Kneff and another musician, and Cherish the Ladies just blew their socks off. They loved it. They, oh, wow. Well, you know what? It. We started going, like, it's funny. You'll find the majority of Irish musicians are in America trying to make their way. Every right. Irish top Irish band is here this month. Um, there's very few traditional bands that tour Ireland because it's not easy to make a living. Right. But we've been doing it every year now, probably about 10 years. We go back every September, and we do a tour in Ireland, and we sell out everywhere. And it's fantastic for me. It's great to go back as an Irish American oh, yeah. um, and go back and be able to go back to these venues and sell them out. But, you know, I think, you know, our, our secret to our success with Cherish the Ladies has been, you know, a great musicianship. I'm surrounded by just fantastic musicians, great dancing, great singing, and we have fun with the audience. And I think that's uh, the key. You know, we understand that it's people are having a good time. They want to go out right. and forget about their worries. But the funny thing for me was arriving in Ireland, you know, for me, it's amazing now as I, I, when I get off that plane, I don't know what it is. There's something in my bones that say I'm home. When I start driving down the road, I don't know what it is. Something comes over me and it happens every single time I get off the plane. It's like, I don't know what's coming up through my feet or something, but there's something that in, in, in comes over me and I just feels like. Um, so finally, about three years ago now, I invested in a house over there. And I again, I didn't know how well, I, I, how much I would like it. I figured about, it was always a dream of mine to have a house in Ireland. And I went to County Clare where my mother comes from a place called Milltown Malbay. And um, it's a beautiful little rural community, has lots of traditional musicians. And it's, they also have the Willie Clancy Festival uh, in July, which is world renowned for traditional musicians. So, um, and I, go, I, went, I bought a house there and I, I tell you, this tells you how crazy it is. When I bought the house and I was cleaning out the closet, I found a picture of myself in the closet. Wow. Yeah, that's a bit freaky. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many houses that you buy do you find a picture no, of yourself. That's that's so, a sign. Yeah, yeah, that was a sign. But anyway, um, you know, but now when I go back and it's been a major source, I, I've been composing a lot of music back there. Whatever it is that, you know, the scenery just takes me away. And, you know, there's something about the people. There's something about um, just the whole vibe of the country. To me, it's it's a re- it nurtures creativity to, to mm-hmm. know abounds. It's that's unbelievable. Right. What are your favorite places in Ireland where you feel that the strongest? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's for me going to West Clare is just beautiful, but I mean, I've, I've traveled the length and breadth of the country and uh, there's just, I, for me, the West is the best. <laughs> you know, I think that's, the, that saying goes true because I mean, especially with, uh, I have a lot of ties because so many of the immigrants that left Ireland in all the tough times during the famine or whether it was in the 1950s where my, when my parents immigrated, there was a massive wave of immigration back then. So I have a lot of friends in, a, in, in America who are from the west of Ireland because th- those were the farming communities. Those were the rural areas that got hardest hit during the downturns in the economy. And, uh, you know, when, when the farm was being handed from one father down to the next, there was only room for one on the farm. The rest of them had to go. You know, it could only feed one. So like in both my parents' cases, they both had to go to and They both came to America and, and, you know, so many tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. And, uh, you know, I think they certainly have 
added to America. I mean, my parents came and worked their behinds off and took every job and anything they wouldn't do. And first thing, you know, educated all their children, get, you know, get through college and, and go on and build, you know, become better people and do big contributions to America. So, but like the music to me is I could never get away with it. I went to college <laughs> to be an accountant, but that wasn't working for me. Right. The music was just calling out and I couldn't quench it. <laughs> and being in Ireland, as you say, makes you feel creative. So the West is great. Are there, is there any other place in, in Ireland that you feel particularly drawn to besides the West? It's okay if it's not. If that's your place, that's your place. No, I mean, for me, you know, they have the Wild Atlantic Way. I mean, there's places like, oh, my my God, up in Antrim, you know, the Giant's Causeway. There's something really beautiful about that place. And Donegal. I mean, I just love Donegal. And I love Connemara. I mean, those are the places that call out to me. Sure. Connemara, to me, is just, just, is just glorious. And, and there's such few houses. You know, so you have this isolation, this you just can commune with nature. It's just you're one with the land and whatever it is. Like I've written a lot of music and, um, you know, I, I do, I'm, I'm one of these people that there's composers that sit down and write because they kind of treat it as a job. You get up and you write. For me, it doesn't work that way. I can't sit down and write. For me, I write when I'm inspired. So, you know, going for a walk along the seashore or, or just driving down and seeing a wild uh, Connemara pony in a field running or, you know, those kinds of things just kind of touch me Mm -hmm. and inspire me to write music. So I'm planning on spending more time. My my house, my little house, which was only 1100 square feet. It's now giving 1400 square feet is being added to it. So that tells you (laughs) (laughs) I'm one of seven children and, you know, everybody's been so busy, but my mother is still around. My mother's still here. My father passed away suddenly, uh, broke his neck walking down the stairs. So, But my mother is still with us and uh, she's young and she's fit and she loves going back to Ireland and loves bringing her kids more because we didn't go back much as children because there were seven of us and where were we going, landing on top of anybody with that. But now all my brothers and sisters want to come over. So, so you've got the house. I'm going to have the house and the bedrooms the to, to hold Isn't that them. that happiness? That's awesome. Yeah. So tell us just a little bit about your new album. Have you written any of the music on it? Yes, I wrote a number of tracks. It's funny, one of the tunes is on there is, is a tune called O'Loughlin's Welcome to Milltown, which is um, from my next door neighbors. When I first bought the house, I don't think they were too thrilled that there was a Yank moving in next door, you know, but they didn't realize that we were so tied to the area. Um, they didn't realize that my mother was from there and that we have all the family and they love me. Now we come back, every time I come back, there's flower pots are overflowing with flowers and the grass is cut and places neat as a pit. So I wrote a tune for them, but um, I also wrote a tune when I went to visit my father's area, a place called Portumna. There's a place called the Workhouse, which was a very sad story in the, in the 1800s that were 163 of these were built to house the poor and starving during the, the Great Famine. And very, very sad. It was extremely um, the most hated and feared institution in all of Ireland. But if you went in there, you were on your last legs. I wrote a march. It's actually the opening track off the album, and it's called the Portumna Workhouse. But I was thinking of all the people that got away from it. And a lot of them got on the boats and came to America, you know. So I wrote five, at least five or six tunes on the new album. I wrote a tune called The Montana Reel. I was out in Montana. Um, my brother bought 100 acres out there. And I was just looking out the Bear Tooth Mountain. And I just, this tune just popped into my head. And boom, I wrote it. And I write in two minutes. And I, I wrote a tune called Farewell to the Catskills. We're driving through the Catskill Mountains uh, out in upstate New York. And this tune just came to me just because the mountains, it was just dusk and these beautiful purple mountains and, and uh, yeah, there. it was yeah. just beautiful. And uh, it was one of these things where I had been going up there all my life up to the Catskills, but I had never, I had always come out of the Catskills and turned right, but my GPS sent me left and sent me down roads. I had never gone down and I was blown away and that tune came into my head. So those kinds of things. Yeah. So I wrote a tune, wrote a tune in Montana. I wrote a tune in Claire. I wrote a tune in, in Galway. And I wrote a tune in the Catskills. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So how can people find you on a uh, website? Facebook? Yeah, we're on the web, uh, Cherish the Ladies. Um, and of course, we're facebook.com forward slash Cherish the Ladies. So, um, you know, we, we, yeah, we're doing this 33 years now. So it's, 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 it's amazing uh, for me as a girl from the Bronx that we're still getting out there and doing and doing over 100 cities a year. And it's and, and the next 2019 is booking up. So I guess we're not stopping. Oh, wow, that's great. Stuff. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say? Anything you'd like to tell the world? Well, I'm, I'm very honored to be on your program. And, and thank you very much for tuning into the podcast. And thank you for doing this because I think it's very interesting. 
and I'm sure people hopefully find a lot of interest in what I said. And I hope they go to Ireland. If you have to, you have to experience Ireland. Uh, anybody you bring there for the first time, I uh, can't believe it. But first of all, you know, you're in a foreign country, but they speak English. So that's easy. <laughs> and there's just something so kind about the people and they're so welcoming. They're so inquisitive. And I really think there's something about the land. I don't know what it is, but it, especially for me, I swear I feel it in my bones that I'm, I'm back home. So I hope that people hear that in my music when I write it. I guess that's the main I'm sure thing. sure they will. We'll make sure that all of the information about how to get to you and the, all of your stuff is on the show notes for this podcast. So thank you so much for chatting. Time. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for talking with us. Appreciate Thanks. it. To tie in with Joni's reflections on her father's hometown of Portumna and her moving musical tribute to the Portumna Workhouse, we're going to highlight the Irish Workhouse Center in Portumna as our feature destination for this podcast. So Port Tumna is a town in East County, Galway. It was established by the Normans in the 12th century, and it sits on the River Shannon, which is the longest river in Ireland, near where it joins Loch Derg. In its day, Port Tumna was an important river crossing. A ferry was established there in the early 14th century, and today there's a swing bridge and a dual-lane highway, the N65, that crosses the river in Port Tumna, and it connects County Galway to County Tipperary. The name Port Omna means landing place or port of the oak. And people have been living in Port Omna since the late Stone Age. The town has a castle, part of which is open to visitors. And it also has a, a lovely forest park with walking and cycling paths interwoven across a woodland and along the shores of Loch Derg. And in that forest are the ruins of an old abbey, an abbey built in 1426 by Murchad O'Madden. Now it's known as the Portumna Abbey. So there's much to do in the town, but probably one of the things the town is best known for is having one of the four restored Irish workhouses open to the public. And in that forest park are the ruins of an old abbey known as the Portumna Abbey. It was founded in 1426 by Murchado Madden. So it's a lovely town to visit. But what it's probably most well-known for today is its restored Irish workhouse, which is interpreting a very painful part of Irish history, but perhaps a necessary part to remember and understand. Well, Irish workhouses operated in Ireland from the early 1840s, pre-famine, to the early 1920s. There were 163 workhouses in total, and they were described as the most feared and hated institutions ever established in Ireland. These workhouses were the last hope, the last possible chance people had for survival. Uh, these people had nowhere else to go. They would work in the workhouse for exchange, in exchange for food, and many were starving by the time they chose the workhouse as the last possible means for survival. The workhouse wasn't a prison. It, wasn't consider, it was more considered an indoor relief system. And the landlords, uh, many of them leveraged the workhouse options as a way to clear the land of people and families who couldn't pay their rents. So people in the workhouse could leave if they wanted to. But the fact that the workhouse was the last possible option for survival and many were starving when they arrived led to the unlikely possibility that families would be strong enough to leave and start over again socially and economically. The Portumna Workhouse was built in 1852, which was actually after the Great Hunger. And today it's been shored up and made ready to receive visitors who are interested in finding out more about the workhouse system. And in Portumna, when you enter that workhouse, the families, when they entered, would be separated. So a family might come in and they would be, boys would go in one place, girls would go in another, men would go in a different place from women. And children that were over two, three and up, would be separated from their mothers. Now, a private group has developed this workhouse site and created it uh, into something called the Irish Workhouse Center. And it's found new uses for the old buildings to bring a significant social and cultural and economic benefit to the area. It's now the arts and heritage and cultural center for the region. And last year, the Irish Workhouse Center won the National Heritage Council Award for its heritage activities. A guided tour through the workhouse in Port Tumna lasts about an hour with complimentary tea and coffee afterwards and a chance to discuss the experience. 
and it's open seven days a week from March to October. In addition to interpreting the history of the workhouse, the Irish Workhouse Center also offers exhibitions. And most recently, it hosted one of the 19th, like a 19th century cooking class and another class on archaeology. And so today, we are very fortunate to have Steve Dolan, who is a historian based in East Galway, and he is the manager of the Irish Workhouse Center. Steve holds an MBA from the National University in Galway and an MA in history from the University of Limerick. He's the editor of the Southeast Galway Archaeological and Historical Society Journal. And this year, his book, All Out, The Birth, Growth, and Decline of Cricket in County Galway, 1825 to 1925, that's a long title, is being published. So Steve, welcome. We are very lucky today to have Steve Dolan. He's a historian based in East Galway and the manager of the Irish Workhouse Center, Portumna. Steve holds an MBA from the National University in Galway and a master's degree from the University in Limerick. This year, his book, All Out, The Birth, Growth, and Decline of Cricket in County Galway, is being published. Welcome, Steve. We're glad to have you. Great to be here, Mindy. Okay. Uh, well, let's talk about the, um, the Irish workhouse and in Portumna. Can you talk a, a little bit about how it got started and the workhouses in general, the history there? Well, the workhouses actually predate the famine, and the, the famine or the great hunger in Ireland, generally the period from 1845 to 1851, 52, was obviously um, perhaps the most important event in Irish history. But the workhouses, many of them were in place and open well before the Great Hunger. So most workhouses in, on the island of Ireland opened up in 1840, 41 and 42. Now, we had 163 in total, and we had 130 built before 1845, and, and a further 33 built during the famine. So we're one of the 33 that was actually built during. And what was it like? Why did people go to a workhouse and what was their experience like? Well, the workhouse was established after the Poor Law Act. Uh, Britain had theirs in 1834. It was passed in the British Parliament for Ireland in 1838. And the idea was that people would enter the workhouse and you would enter as a family and you would work inside the four walls in return for food. So it was a, a very harsh regime. It was uh, constructed and designed to be very unattractive. The conditions were to be worse than the lowest class of labour outside. Uh, so I know you know your history, Mindy, that, that in Ireland would have been a, a, an achievement given what we were going through in that period. You know, you entered as a family and you were split up in the admissions room between boys, girls, men and women. And virtually all the workhouses in Ireland are built on a H-block plan. So girls went in one corner, boys in another, men and women, the fathers and mothers. And, you know, near the twain shall meet, um, certainly in the early decades, they, they never saw each other again while they were in the workhouse complex. Yeah, I remember visiting the workhouse. And um, one of the things that I recall, and in fact, it was also one of the things that Joni Madden recalled when I was ch chatting with her about her visit, because it's stunning when you hear it, is that the children were separated from the mothers right away, um, except the very young, and that the windows were built so that they couldn't see out in the play yard when the children were playing. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, the, the room I'm speaking in at the moment is, is and was the old uh, manager's office. And the beside me is the Board of Guardians room. And the windows are very high one side of the room because the men who sit there, and it was a man's world in the middle of the 19th century, uh, and a very cruel world, uh, didn't want to look at the starving girls the other side of the wall. And the windows on the front of the building are actually quite low so they could look out on a picturesque town. But the entire complex is designed so that, um, you know, families don't get to see each other. Men and women are separated. And the motivation for that really was uh, as a punishment, if you like, to men. Poverty was seen as a crime, very much so in the Victorian era. And to make it as unattractive as possible for the mothers, children, as you say, were removed from them. So as soon as a child hit the age of three, they were put in with the boys and the girls and removed from their mothers. So it was just one of many cruel rules and cruel aspects to the entire system and the, the working life and the daily life of inmates. Mm -hmm. And so how many people actually got out of the workhouse? Was it typical that you'd come in and you would go out or did people die there or did they starve there? What was it like? 
during the, the, the famine era, the, the 1845 to early 1850s, many, many thousands died within the workhouse complex because they were vastly overpopulated, hugely overpopulated. I mean, the complex here is built for 600. So 150 boys, girls, men, women. The nearest town to us here is Loch and that was built for 800 and again, 200 of each. But throughout that period in the larger workhouses, there was more than double what the capacity was. So people were, were packed in, they were malnourished, they weren't treated well inside the complex. Their immune systems were you know, shot to hell. And the infirmaries in these complexes were just places of disease and death. So you came in voluntarily. I mean, they, they, but I think that it is a bit of a moot point. You had nowhere else to go. And you could leave, but where would you go? The very reason you came in is because you had been evicted and you couldn't afford to pay your rent and you had nowhere else to go. Yeah, that makes sense. So tell us about how the workhouse today interprets that history. Well, there are four workhouses open in Ireland today. We're quite lucky there's one in each province. Um, We're the only one that tells the workhouse story and focuses exclusively on the workhouse story. And we're fortunate we have the entire complex still standing. Our friends in Dunamore in County Leash, which is the one in Leinster, uh, they have an agricultural museum. In Kim McThomas in Waterford, which is the one in Munster, they manage the Blue Way, which is the tourism for the region. Yeah, the workhouse in Ulster is in Carrick Macross in County Monaghan, and uh, the, their main benefactor is uh, Sting from Sting and the Police, whose ancestors actually came from that workhouse. Um, you know, it's funny, I was giving a, a lecture last night in Innocent County Clare, and uh, one of the people at the end started the Q&A and asked me, you know, what is the point? What was the legacy? What, how are we to look at that period? And how are we to view workhouses in the context of Irish history? And my response was, despite everything, despite the massive disease, the overcrowding, um, you know, despite uh, how we see it today in many ways, I lost my dad at Christmas. Um, he lived a great life, but he, he wouldn't come up and visit me here in the complex because he associated the workhouse with famine and uh, poverty and all the negative connotations. And obviously in the Irish context, there's a certain amount of shame of our history, despite it not being of our making. But I said the legacy is one of hope because in the room last night, there may only have been 40 or 50 people, but there were people in that audience who would not be alive were it not for the workhouse system. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that as well as acknowledging the sadder and more difficult parts uh, of Irish history that we're constantly grappling with. That's a very profound way of thinking. Um, and I think there is a certain attraction to that kind of history to people that are on the outside. You know, we hear the stories about the workhouse and and they are very sad stories, but to be able to, you know, it, there's something that makes you wonder about that kind of sadness when you're not from the area. So it's a great service to visitors, I think. I'm going to ask you, uh, so when people come in, they they go right to the very same place that families went, right? The same reception area. Yeah, they come through the reception, which was the reception in 1851. We, we started taking our first inmates. Uh, the entire H block complex was open from 1852. So they actually come in um, as people came in as families 150 years ago and more, and they're brought into the Board of Guardians room and the period is discussed. And then the workhouse system that we've been discussing here is discussed and explained. And I think it's very important for younger Irish people because the world has changed a lot. And I think the type of history being taught in Irish schools is quite different than even when I was in school 20 years ago. And it's important that the generation coming now appreciate this as an, as an important part of our history as much as anything that happened in the 20th century. And it forms such a huge part of who we are and why we think uh, the way we do, you know. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed when I was there was um, the artifacts you had. You know, you had some artifacts from the day. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we're, we're, we're quite lucky because the man who's been involved from the very outset is Dr. Christy Kniff, who's a huge friend of ours here uh, and a, a somewhat of a legend in archaeology and local history in the west of Ireland. And Christy, even through walking the fields and a very basic um, you know, uh, uh, view of the topsoil and the surface, because we do not have a license to go excavating, has uncovered an amount of artefacts, uh, so much so that uh, through fundraising, uh, mainly through Christy and, and myself and through different conferences, 
we're going to open a museum here uh, in, in the latter part of this year, and we're really excited about it. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, I was impressed by the artifacts. So the what can you just describe what visitors might see when they come into the workhouse? What for those that have never seen a workhouse? Well, they, they come in what was the admissions room, and I mentioned about being in the Board of Guardians room, which is just to the right. Upstairs here in the girls' block is where the girls' dormitories used to be. And to be honest, Mindy, we have exhibitions there 24-7. Um, we have a fantastic arts festival here each September called Shorelines. And it is uh, Johnny Madden and some other terrific artists come over every couple of years. And we have exhibitions from the National Museum, from Road Infrastructure Ireland in relation to archaeology. And we're moving a lot into the art sphere. So this year we have four different artists uh, producing work that are broadly related to either the workhouse system or the famine in general in Ireland. And the first of those starts later this month with the sculptor Kieran Tuvi, who has been commissioned to do work for many of the top universities in the US. So we're really delighted that he's, uh, he's uh, honoured us with giving us his work for the month. So from late March to late April, uh, we'll be exhibiting the work of Kieran Tuvi. That's great. And can you talk a little bit about your own contribution to the community with your workforce and how you hire people and the opportunities you offer there? Yeah, well, I, my, my background, Mindy, was in finance. I was 20 years working for uh, uh, financial firms and banks and so on. And I had a bit of a conversion a few years ago. And I took over this complex, uh, the, the Workhouse Centre. But it's only one part of what we do, because when we actually started as a charity 20 years ago, it was providing computing skills uh, or with a view to providing computer, computing skills to the long-term unemployed. And we still have two staff that uh, teach PTEC 3 and 5, which is a fairly reasonable level, uh, to the long-term unemployed and allows them to get work. We used to manage the tourism for the region and hope to do so again. We own the mental health centre here in town that we went to the government, uh, the, the HSC, which is the health service executive in Ireland. And again, we do that at cost. Uh, we have one member of staff that visits older people who are living on their own and at risk rural isolation, so it provides company for them. And we do that through grants. And we do a hell of a lot of fundraising as well. So my staff here come from the Live Register themselves also, and they're all on three-day weeks. And they're terrific people because uh, I'm always complaining, Mindy, that uh, you know we're stuck out here in our geographic area on the Shannon. It's quite beautiful, but we're, we're over an hour from Galway City. But it's uh, I joke that my staff here are my prisoners because uh, they're so far away from a major city. Uh, they tend to come back every year. And the standard of my, my staff is the very highest. And I say that as somebody who used to be regional manager for a bank here in Ireland. Um, the staff I have here are better than I've ever had before. They're really committed. They do a huge amount of good. This coming weekend for the St. Patrick's Day Festival, we have uh, a special train day on the St. Patrick's Day on the Saturday. And we're uh, looking at the history of railways in Ireland uh, for children. And then on Sunday, we have Minecraft, uh, if ever you've heard of it, uh, which kids are all into online. And on the Monday, we have a Lego day. So that's a means of getting children in, then asking them questions when they're here and having fun and explaining this difficult part of history in a less frightening way for smaller children. Uh, mm -hmm. We've constantly school tours coming in. And, you know, as a charity, we take our responsibilities uh, quite seriously and the thing I'm most proud of actually Mindy was last year we won an award for holding a Polish day here because for the first time ever uh, the second race in the 26 counties in the Republic of Ireland are Polish people and mm -hmm. not British people so when you think about however long man is on the planet earth uh, it's quite extraordinary that the second race in Ireland will be Polish people and there's been a real boon to uh, the west of Ireland which has been ravaged by immigration uh, they've integrated so well, and it's uh, it's lovely to have a day like that, that the two separate nationalities, but almost one culture at this stage, can you know break bread together. And, and, uh, and not many people know the All-Ireland champion for under-12 uh, dancing is actually a Polish kid uh, who's a fantastic Polish dancer as well. And there are so many links, even back to the famine, with a, a man called Pavel Stravleski, who was a Polish man who came to Ireland, and he did so much good here in uh, raising uh, funds and in poor relief. And it's lovely to have a historical legacy as well as a modern legacy with, with another race in Europe, you know? Right, right, right. So I, I just want to ask, there's a, a theory. Let's talk about this. This is always a, a, a crazy thing to talk about with people when I bring it up. But 
there's a theory that um, that wherever there is a high concentration of human emotion, you know, like a battlefield or a, a very, very happy home, you know, it doesn't have to be bad, it can be good, but when uh, a graveyard, you know, when, when you constantly pile emotion upon emotion upon emotion, the area itself sort of absorbs that energy and sometimes you know, sort of bores a hole between the veil that separates the eternal world from this world. You know, you, I just think of um, Gettysburg is, is one here that's very similar to that, where people can almost uh, sense the, the people that were there before. And that was the feeling I got when I went into the dormitory in Pumna. It's just so beautifully done. You know, there isn't any extra decor. It's just simple beds across the room. And as I walked into it, it was, I, I got a, a strong sense of the people that were there before. So what must it be like to work in a place like that? Do you ever sense the, uh, the presence of the people that were there many years ago? You know, it, 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 it's so true, Mindy. I, I, I have a fantastic board of directors, uh, all voluntary, and they do so much good. But one of them, who is a, a lovely guy, uh, an accountant, is it always encouraging me to invest, in, as if we had the money, but invest in a kind of a, a hologram effect, that we'd have one hologram that would welcome people in and explain a little bit about the history. And I said, we'll never do that, because we want to keep the buildings as they were, and I think that, that all contributes to the feel that people get when they come in. But there is no doubt this is a hell of a place. There is no doubt that there is. Um, going from one room to another, even, you can get a different feeling. Like we, I'm looking out here as I'm speaking to you at the dining hall and chapel, which was the middle prong, if you like, of the H block. And there's a completely different feeling and atmosphere in there than there is in the women's dormitories. And again, than there is in the laundry room, which I find a very difficult place to enter, to be honest. Uh, and even out to the infirmary, there's no doubt that you're in the presence of layers of history and layers of life experiences. And truth be told, not all of them good. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I felt. Yet I'm so glad I went there because it was a, it's something I always wondered about. So what you have there is an amazing opportunity to interpret that history. And really have just done such a great job with that. Thank you, Megan. Is there anything you'd like to tell potential visitors that might come to the workhouse before we end our talk? Well, just so that they get a warm welcome, I think you can tell history in various different ways. I don't think there's any better way than face-to-face -face and going somewhere and experiencing it from people who love what they're doing as well. This isn't a state-run institution or, you know, run by the government where people are coming in, picking up a wage. Everyone that's here are people who want to be here, want to, it's a real community effort. The workhouse was saved from destruction by the local people, by some of the people that work here today. And, you know, there'll always be a, a, a cup of coffee and some bickies uh, or something nice after the tour as well to discuss the wider aspects of Irish history. But I just feel there's nothing like the experience of going somewhere and seeing firsthand and feeling firsthand, as, as you outlined, what a particular place or what a particular aspect of history was like. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you for the time. I, I also thank Joni Madden for highlighting Portumna. She does it, you know, I just not only in our interview, but I went to a concert that she did in Maryland and she wrote this beautiful, I'm sure you've heard it, this beautiful uh, kind of uh, air to Portumna and because her father is from there. And she mentions it at the concerts, you know, so she's sort of spreading the word. <laughs> Lots of people are hearing about it. And we're really proud of her uh, because, you know, it's funny, Portumna is a town, uh, Mindy, like I come from a, a, a slightly more affluent uh, town uh, further west and uh, closer to the city, so it's commuting distance. But Portumna is such a special town. It's I joke when I'm trying to tease them here that it's like an episode of the Golden Girls going down the street because the age profile is a little bit older. But it's a town run by very dynamic women who power it on. And in, we have the Shorelines Arts Festival. We have we had the play here last year. Even things like the hurling clubs and the community groups and the town hall. It's usually uh, a strong lady powering it on and we're just so lucky that we have the right blend of people here to make the most of what is in the town because there's a forest park there's obviously the castle which is juxtaposed to the workhouse itself and uh, the town hall is terrific and we're on the banks of the shannon and lock Derg, so its beauty is what uh, is actually what attracted me to here in the first place it's, it's, it's just a beautiful place yeah 
Well, Steve, thanks so much for talking with us today. And we'll be sure to put Portumna on the tours next year so we can, you know, bring a few more people there. I think it's, it certainly is a thin place, you know, for, for what we are looking at, it, it fits that mold. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Great stuff, Mandy. Nice to talk to you. I want to tack on to Steve's interview a little of my own impressions when I visited Portumna Workhouse as a visitor. And it was a few years back, my husband and I were in Clare, Galway, and I said, I really want to see this. I've, I've always had a curiosity about the whole workhouse system, and it's very well done. It's huge, for one thing. It's, it's very big, and they haven't dressed it up and made it, you know, a beautiful building. It's very much like it was... Uh, Back in the day, even with the same doors, some of the doors have old writing on them from the time when people were there. So one question I get all the time is, what can we see in Ireland? And there's all the stuff that is in the guidebooks. Ireland has an abundance of sites to see for visitors. But this is pretty central. And if you get a chance to stop into Portumna, the river walk is lovely. The forest walk through there in that old abbey is certainly worth, uh, worth seeing. Um, and the workhouse is worth seeing. There's a, a very moving part of the workhouse. When you go out onto the road outside the wall, looking back into the grounds, it's a big grassy area and it's a burial ground, I think, for the people that, that died there. There were so many people that died in the workhouse and it's a very large area. None of the graves are marked. Um, it's just a grassy knoll. And there's a little sign on the wall facing the highway remembering those people. And if there's one thing the Irish do well, it is interpret the sad times and remember their songs, their poetry, the monuments that they've built. So it's definitely, definitely a worthwhile destination to visit. I want to thank you for listening to the Thin Places Travel Podcast today. And if you have any questions or thoughts uh, or travel stories you'd like to share or sites that you'd like us to feature on the podcast, you can find us on the web at thinplacespodcast.com. That's also where you'll find the show notes. If you want to reach out to us, just click the contact link. You can also find me on Twitter at at Travel Hags and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash thinplaces. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a quick rating on iTunes um, and, and consider subscribing. We hope you'll join us next time because in our next episode, we'll have Daryl Malloy, and he's a Celtic priest from Inishmore on the Aran Islands. We'll be talking about places of resurrection. So, so long for now. Thank you for listening. And please be sure to check out our tours to mystical sites at thinplacestour.com. The music for this podcast is Native Spirit, performed by Cheryl Ann Fulton from her collection, The Once and Future Harp. Goodbye for now. Wishing you love and light and every blessing.